opportunity to speak with you today. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to keep my camera off to avoid the lag and the robotic sounds that tend to come with Zoom during these sessions. But um, you know, my goal today really is to talk a little bit about how identity has really changed over the last years and, and really become much more ingrained in the fabric of overall IT security. Um, and, and even though that has occurred, we're still kind of seeing authentication lagging a bit behind where some of the demands, especially the demands that have come uh, in light of today's working from home, remote workforce uh, uh, brought on quickly by the pandemic. And, and talk a little bit, how do we evolve to a more modern form of authentication that moves beyond traditional username and password? And, and then tell you a little bit about beyond identity as well. Um, you know, and our mission is just that, to actually eliminate passwords and all the risk and vulnerability that comes with them, but do so in a way in replacing it with a capability that actually increases the controls and visibility around access while reducing your reliance on legacy VPN and multi-factor authentication. And, and do this in a way that can greatly improve the user experience, but also enable a better and more modern form, a stronger form of authentication. Um, myself, I head up strategy and business development. Um, I've been in identity management for over 20 years now, started with a company called Corion in the identity governance and administration space. Uh, came on board while we were still in stealth mode um, early last year. Uh, we launched the company formally in April. Our founders are Jim Clark and TJ Germaluk. Uh, Jim and TJ have been business partners for over 30 years, starting at their days of Silicon Graphics. For those of you who remember SGI back in the day, Jim was a co-founder and chairman there, and TJ uh, was the uh, president and COO. Uh, they went on to do a company called Netscape that some of you might have heard of, uh, and then a number in TJ founded At Home Networks, which was one of the first broadband providers to the home in the US. So the two of them were highly responsible for getting the World Wide Web in everybody's hands and have come back around to form Beyond Identity because, you know, almost, uh, you know, Jim's apologizing for what he did with Netscape, which really made the username password this ubiquitous uh, logon experience and really kind of what we're trying to do to, to change that narrative. So before kind of starting in there and, and you know, just to kind of highlight, I think it's, it, it's interesting to note how attacks have changed over time. Uh, there was a recent movie, I'm blanking on the name of it, that was on Netflix and part of all the pandemic sit at home Netflix binging that was going on. I was watching some of it with Denzel Washington was on there and he, it's a story about him as an old cop coming back and working, coming back to the organizations and, you know, being a uh, providing support there. And they're all doing this modern stuff. And one of the guys says to him, he said, things have really changed since you've been here last. And his comment was, you know, we're still, you know, has it really changed? I mean, we're still out there to catch the bad guys, right? And ultimately that's still what we're doing, but it's been interesting to see how the focus on user-based risk and user at the center of attacks has kind of evolved over time. And back in the days of data centers and distributed computing, a lot of the attacks went after users with some pretty unsophisticated tactics such as you know, dumpster diving to try to get sensitive, sensitive information out of garbage cans and pails. Uh, tailgating to get into the building with that ability to try to gain access once they did, or spoofing a help desk as somebody that needed a password reset and using that as the way to try to get into the networks. Well, as we built better controls around that, put more security focus on these types of tactics, we also started to see the computing models change to more distributed computing and networks. And the focus of the attack started to go after the the machines and the devices themselves with the increase in viruses and malware and botnet attacks. And, and while those still exist, we've really seen the shift over the last few years go back towards the user centric attacks, but with different forms and different methods, obviously with phishing attacks and just talking to the number of companies who have just seen an exponential increase in phishing attacks, especially uh, with the work from home environment, very clever targeting things such as COVID relief or where to get testing or just preying on the news of the day to try to get more and more sophisticated ways of launching phishing attacks, many of which are going after to try to steal credentials and passwords. 
overall credential stuffing continues to be on the rise and the ability of purchasing lists on the dark web of users' passwords and trying those passwords for uh, the corporate accounts continues to just grow at the increasingly alarming rate. And as more and more uh, organizations really embracing a cloud first approach that, you know, it really is the credentials the attackers are going because the bottom line is they don't need to break in anymore. They just need to log in. And all of these attacks really centering around trying to get access to the credentials and knowing that the password continues to be the primary form of control to gain that access. Thus, the reason we're seeing phishing attacks, credential stuffing, password misuse continue to grow. Even ransomware, there was, I was listening to a recent presentation by, um, I'm here in the Boston area with the head of the cyber group in the New England area was saying that even with ransomware, they've seen about 75 to 80% now going leveraging uh, RDP attacks or credential theft as a way of launching ransomware to complement kind of what they continue to do on the phishing side. And also with man in the middle session hijacking attacks, looking at credentials as the way of getting in, it's not a surprise why we see these in the headlines every day. And, you know, this is a slide that we can continue to update every week where, you know, and, and it's just staggering figures. You know, Spotify over 380 million records, 350,000 username and passwords. And uh, those were breached leveraging credential stuffing attacks. You know, we've seen the Twitter uh, recent breach with social engineering and administrators asked to quote unquote reset passwords, which were fished and used to hack user accounts, including the former president's account. Bonobos, uh, 7 million addresses uh, compromised, account information, partial credit cards, all stolen from a backup in the cloud using, guess what, a password, an administrative password. And even the solar winds attack, which obviously has grabbed a significant amount of headlines, you know, started with a stolen credential, was able to bypass the MFA, malicious source code was checked in, and then several downstream attack vectors that all relied on the stolen credentials as a start. So, you know, continue to see the headlines. We continue to see this as the primary form of attack by the hackers. Um, and obviously coming from beyond identity and our mission to eliminate passwords, we do our best to badmouth them every day. I'm sure nobody on this uh, call and in the security world is gonna to try to defend them, but I do feel it's good to give credit where credit is due because if you saw this article about Stefan Thomas who was locked out of his Bitcoin wallet because he can't remember his password, this is another side on why so many people hate passwords. So as I said, give it credit where it's due. It, it actually worked in this case. But I think if you ask Stefan Thomas, you know, he's got a really big password issue as well. So, you know, why is it we're still talking about this, right? And, and, you know, Bill Gates back in his 2004 RSA security keynote predicted the death of the password. In his words, traditional password-based security was headed for extinction because it cannot meet the challenge of keeping critical information secure. So over 15 years ago, we highlighted this. We highlighted this as a concern, but we haven't gone too far. Uh, LastPass did a recent survey that showed the average business user had 191 passwords. And uh, I was recently doing a kind of a virtual roadshow uh, and talking about you know th this figure, which just seemed staggering to me. And, and uh, CISOs in the room were saying, oh, I'm up to 300 or I'm up to 250. So I, I think it's a conservative estimate that we just still have so many passwords. Um, I, I think some of the statistics I saw, there's over 300 billion passwords in use today by humans and machines alike. But according to a recent Verizon data breach report, over 80% of the confirmed data breaches they were looking at were due to reused, weak, or stolen passwords. And, and when you really kind of scratch your head and wonder then why are they so out there, so still such a concern, um, this was a, a report that was done by uh, Microsoft Research of, few years ago, but they really highlighted a couple key issues here that, you know, despite the countless attempts and near universal desire to replace passwords, they're more widely used and firmly entrenched than ever before, which the last past data seems to support. You know, they prove themselves a very worthy opponent against all who've kind of attempted to replace them and fail. It, it, it kind of reminds me of the the old Monty Python and the Holy Grail scene where they're saying, bring out the dead. And one poor old man's out there saying, I'm not dead yet. And clearly the passwords are doing this. 
And the reason being, and I think they summed it up well here, that no other technology matches the combination of cost, immediacy, and convenience that the username and password possesses. I mean, it's free to implement. It's built into the applications. There's nothing to buy or to configure or to build into your solutions. And as a result, they just continue to proliferate and grow throughout the organization. And so when we've kind of looked at the history of authentication over the decades, you know, really passwords first came into being out of MIT back in the 60s. And, you know, until we really kind of hit the 80s when Netscape and the commercial inter internet really started to launch this at scale, where more and more users were accessing resources that required username and passwords. We just saw this incredible increase in the use. And also the abuse and the uh, attacks started to really center back towards that users. And that's why in the early 2000s, we spent the better part of our security initiatives helping organizations understand how do we make longer, stronger passwords? You know, it was the constant debate on how many characters and which characters, and but at the same time in rotating and changing these passwords more often. But how many times have we seen the users who started with the password password, then we needed numbers, say password one, two, three, and then special characters, it was password one, two, three with an exclamation mark, constantly how we educated users on how important passwords were, but the struggle we did, and the more we did, what did that mean? Well, it meant more calls to the help desk with uh, people forgetting their passwords or needing to update their passwords and continuing to be caught in this ongoing struggle and the cost involved with that with support and help desk. So really, as we started to really recognize the risk, that's where you know a lot of initiatives started in uh, kind of the last decade or so around password managers, where it would be easier if you just put all these passwords in a vault and have that vault recycle those passwords and change them and make them more complex for the end user. And they wouldn't have to do anything other than remember their password to get into the vault. And while that added some layers of uh, security and improvement in the recycling and complexity of passwords, there was still a username and password to get into that vault. And all of those major password vault vendors have come under attacks and breaches as well, because obviously you can get into there, you can get resources for a broad set of credentials. Single sign-on takes that step further, really kind of building more controls, more security in place, while at the same time trying to make it more convenient for the, convenient for the end user as well. And then all of a sudden we realize that if we're still protecting that with a username and password, we better make it more secure. And two-factor authentication and MFA, multi-factor authentication uh, started to come around and, and continued, especially as we went to uh, a broader, more uh, remote workforce. But really kind of, uh, you know, within the, you know, the past five to 10 years, we started to see the initial efforts, really early efforts to really try to look at password lists as a concept and theme for organizations. You know, the FIDO Alliance uh, emerged with great support from a number of leading technology vendors to try to make passwords less of a, uh, an issue when it comes to web-based resources. We've also seen other initiatives sprout up from a, a lot of major vendors as well with solutions that are quote unquote passwordless, but really their aim and mission is around the end user bypassing the password. You know, the passwords still exist. There's still shared secrets underneath, but if we can avoid the end user, is that more of a user experience than a security measure? Uh, I, I would argue yes, but at least start to put and plant the seed in the concept of needing to try to move away from this tremendous, the strong uh, volume of passwords that continue out there, despite the weakness and vulnerability of them. So as we've kind of looked at authentication changing over the years, trying to address a lot of these security initiatives, we've also seen that the whole notion of access management and how we manage access has also, also gone under pretty significant change. You know, in the past when we were really protecting users and the devices and the resources, it was really building that strong perimeter around this and then punching holes through the firewall when users outside of those circles needed to uh, gain access. But the idea was that if we can really control who's coming into our network and the devices that are on that network and the, you know, we're, we're providing a layer of security and benefit 
around the resources and the monitoring of that access. But then more and more remote workers came in. And at first it was trying to move from sites to site and using VPNs to kind of gain access into that network. Then we had contractors and third party vendors who needed access to corporate resources. We started to see more bring your own device and really kind of the proliferation of mobile devices and tablets and a personal computer or personally owned laptops and desktops coming into the network over public and private clouds with more and more cloud applications as more organizations trying to move to a cloud first type of approach. And even the internet of things where various devices themselves are accessing uh, these resources. It really broke down this whole notion of being able to build a perimeter and just keep punching holes in the firewall to gain access. It really put a lens on how do we really ensure that the right users are getting the right access and doing the right things with it. And it really changed the whole notion of identity uh, management from kind of an administrative task that we still needed to look at the life cycle of uh, provisioning from setting up, modifying and disabling access. Um, because one of the biggest concerns were ghost accounts for people who left organizations, but those accounts still stayed open long after people left or having far more privileges than, than they needed, which really as more regulation and compliance came along, there were more and more focus on that on identity governance and having managers truly attest to the fact that people needed the access they had and looking at how are we protecting that access? What controls are in place? for stronger authentication. Again, driving more and more interest in, in um, multi-factor authentication. But really, as we started to look at this, um, you know, Jared Benson, the CISO of Coke Industries, I think summed this up really well. And we really saw that many companies were already moving in this direction, but in the post-pandemic world, it's just sped up significantly. So when you've added work from home or work from wherever to the equation, you know, we're in a new technology world and the control model just simply doesn't work where the cloud is our data center, the internet is the network and any device is a work device. So it really has put this perspective that identity as this new perimeter. And instead of this big castle wall that we surround our users and devices and networks with, we understand that to secure, we need to secure the identity of that individual, not, not just the password itself, not just make the password harder as the entry point, but how do we put a really deeper view on that identity? And an identity, you know, a username password is good to kind of say, yeah, okay, that's Kurt, he's in, but it wasn't enough. But now we know that access evolves from not just a one and done binary decision, yes and no, but how do we look at this on a continuous basis to know not just the identity, but the device that that identity is trying to use to gain access, the location, the behavior, the network that it's on, really looking at this uh, perspective has, it, it's just become clear that you can't really separate identity and security anymore. Trust has been pushed all the way to that endpoint at the front, not just as something we monitor and identify later in the equation, but to truly look and positively identify that user in the endpoint is a critical requirement now for protection and, and really where uh, the whole notion on zero trust has emerged. And, you know, the fundamental assertions are that the network is always assumed to be hostile and that external and internal threats always exist on that network. So how can we, you know, knowing that the network can no longer be sufficient for deciding trust anymore. And that every device, every user in that flow needs to be authenticated and authorized and, and preferably on a continuous basis. And what telemetry and what signals do we have to understand and gain visibility into that so we can assemble the right kinds of policies to know how do we take this data to really assess the risk of that user and the risk of that device and triangulate this in a way to really apply the appropriate level policy. If they're on a personal device, they can get access to these resources, but we really want it to be a corporate managed device to get to the more risky uh, resources and applications or actions within those applications.
how do we baseline and understand more normalcy? And, and as many organizations are starting the first journey around this, when we did the work from home, now everything looked like a risk signal because we saw users coming in from devices and networks and resources that they never had before. So it's this constant evolution on really understanding how we build an, the acceptable amount of risk that we're willing to do, the acceptable levels of behavior. And, and you know, the bottom line is just, it really has, you know, with identity as the new perimeter, we have to earn trust before you're allowed to gain access. And that trust goes beyond just validating the user but really looking at the device and the trustworthiness of the device and the other aspects that come along with it. It's just a requirement today that identity and security are hand in hand working through this from a policy, a monitoring, monitoring capabilities, visibility, but also to kind of really make good strong policy decisions. And I think as, as this is continuing to grow and you know, you constantly look at kind of the balance on what this means to our organizations. And as we try to give users broader access to more sensitive personal information, it really added to the criticality of this, that the emphasis and the pendulum tended to swing towards security. And it really kind of brings up the constant trade-off that we have between strong security and usability and efficiency for the users. And as I mentioned before, the first step of that was, you know, as more and more sensitive information from more resources became the norm, we started with longer, stronger, more frequently changed passwords. And obviously that added to the security, but reduced the user experience. And as I mentioned before, led to exponential growth of calls to the help desk where reset passwords was the number one call, even to our external call centers with our customers who are using passwords to gain access. So knowing the password was so weak, we did multi-factor authentication or, or MFA. And it, it's interesting to note, I think uh, obviously the importance of MFA adding additional layers, but a couple interesting things have been occurring recently where obviously that adds more friction to the equation. I was talking to a CISO the other day and he said, oh, MFA, you mean most friction available? And uh, you know, I wanted to coin that term because I do think a lot of people will, will relate to that. I was even talking to another organization that when they're doing more and more phishing simulation, when a user clicks on a phishing attempt and fails that uh, simulated attack, their first course of action is to give them more MFA. So they actually use it as a punitive nature for people who are failing phishing attacks and just saying, basically, you can't be trusted. So we're going to make it even harder for you to log in. But the other aspect of that is, is was seen in the SolarWinds attack and others. They're coming under more attack themselves. So as these layers have been added on, we've seen the attackers go after them as well. Microsoft recently even put out a full notice that don't rely on SMS as a way of doing multi-factor authentication just due to SIM card hijacking or even brute force attacks, just seeing those uh, under more and more attack. Especially any push notification, one of the common themes is attackers will do these brute force attacks that if they just keep sending enough notices, eventually an end user to stop the annoyance will say, yes, that's me or trust that that access is appropriate. So as you know, we've also, as I mentioned before, virtual private networks, which were set up for other purposes, but now we're even seeing organizations accessing cloud applications through VPNs, which just, just makes you scratch your head, but you recognize, well, it's the only way we could probably get visibility into the devices coming in. But we were talking with one customer that they're, when they went to work from home, their users had to log into the VPN and they had a 20 character uh, password to do that. They had to, launch the desktop, the browser, open up Salesforce, put in a separate password for Salesforce, and then use Salesforce Authenticator to step up authentication. So all of that to allow somebody just to gain access to Salesforce was just incredible friction in the organization. So also mobile device management, endpoint detection and response as well, EDR to give you more signals and visibility on the devices themselves, which are critically important. But again, on personal devices, is an end user going to allow? Uh, MDM solution to be in place. And the organization can say, well, if not, then they don't use that. So now they're not using that mobile device, which reduces the efficiency as well. And then constantly with the simulated phishing and security awareness training, which is so critical today, 
but is really burdening down users as they are, you know, failing more phishing. And we were even seeing organizations starting to bring that into performance uh, reviews on if you can't be trusted and if you continue to fail these, you need to step up or we've even seen some organizations start to let people go who can't necessarily follow the um, security guidance. And that training constantly evolving as the attacks evolve are just putting even more uh, burden on our end users. So it was a lot of these factors that, you know, back when we were actually looking at launching Beyond Identity and putting the company together and doing our research, we spent a lot of time just talking to organizations about, well, what would an ideal solution look like? And constantly what came up is as we need to modernize the authentication, the first thing that always came up is eliminating passwords. You know, how can we continue to rely on this highest risk, most vulnerable control as our primary control to gain access? But more important than ever before, we have to positively validate the user and the devices that they're on, making it easy for users to gain that access uh, at the same time. And it couldn't be just layering more and more friction in that equation, which causes more and more uh, problems in, to the user experience. And I would say it's, as we've you know had to do these things, it really has become like airline travel, you know, where we've come to accept long lines and intrusive controls just due to the inherent risk that's out there. We're asking our end users to do the same thing in an IT and setting as well. So how do we do all this? How do we make it easier, but at the same time, reduce the IT and help desk burden uh, that comes that when you're changing that user experience, that first experience of logging on, uh, that also and adding friction generally calls, leads to calls to IT on our external facing situations, it's calls to the call center. And really, I mean, how do we do this without making increased burden on our support centers? And the other aspect of it too, which came more and more is that we really do need to understand the devices before they're gaining access. So only trusted devices with the organization defining exactly what trust means can get access. You know, it's one thing giving MFA, but what if your user is coming in on a computer in a library that contains a ton of malware or other uh, intrusive risk aspects or at home and grab your kid's laptop and who knows what might be on that laptop. So how can we have more visibility into this and evaluate the risk on a continuous basis? So one of the big themes that always came up with authentication is that we need to get away from this one and done event that authentication is just something that happens once you get in and then we don't think about it again until we log you off or uh, expire that session. How do we make authentication a continuous process without providing or in creating more burden for the end users? In that allowing adaptive access controls to give different risk signals access to different resources, applications, or um, uh, actions within those resources. And at the end of the day, allowing a variety of devices, but ensuring those devices meet the security and compliance requirements we have. You know, that to gain access to patient data, it needs to be a desktop with disk encryption enabled. So the analogy I use is the picture references here. It is kind of like the airport where you need to show your government official uh, uh, issued ID. You need to make sure it is truly a government ID. And then we know it is CURT. But we also need to send you through the image scanning and metal detectors as well to make sure that what you are doing is trustworthy before gaining access. But unlike airport security, we need to figure out a way of doing this more efficiently. And, and this was really the challenge that we took on with Beyond Identity. And as we were starting to look through all these factors and how can we make this easier? How can we make this experience the option to provide more security up front without it really impacting the end user, we were looking around at the various technologies and we've seen various efforts around, you know, blockchain or user behavior, even typing analysis, looking at that as a factor of assessing risk. But really, as we were trying to look through this, we started to look at areas and cases where, you know, the security and the security controls are really strong. And one of the ones, you know, with Jim Clark as our founder, they created SSL back in the day, which if you've really, as it's evolved to TLS, you know, it really hasn't changed too much in the decades um, since its inception. 
And we were kind of looking at that a, a, as a model where you would have this chain of trust for server to server validation, uh, which relied on X509 certificates, which were generally managed by organizations who uh, could handle the management with the issuing and reissuing and revocation of certificates. But you would have certificates on each server. So when uh, Amazon was trying to communicate with PayPal, that for a transaction, it would validate that that it really is a PayPal site using private and public key signing. But again, kind of having the uh, administration of this through the central certificate authority on each of those servers. And as a result, the way that it was done was this is where we created the username password as that way of getting the end user to come into this chain uh, and complete these transactions. And still today, over trillions of dollars of transactions occur every day secured by uh, certificates, X509 certificates and TOS. So what we looked at was how do we take this challenge of extending that chain of trust to the users and their devices? And a couple things allowed us to do that. First and foremost is we have the secure enclave and TPMs on these devices. So we actually have a place now where we can store that private key. But the other impediment to this always was nobody wanted to be a certificate authority for every end user out there. So what we look to do is how can we actually create a notion of a personal certificate authority where every end user is their own CA without knowing what one is or actually does, um, but at the same time, enable them to be pulled into this chain of trust without any centralized certificate management. And that's what we did with Beyond Identity. Uh, we created the Beyond Identity Authenticator, which provides passwordless authentication. And as opposed to just bypassing the password, we can truly eliminate the password and replace it with X509 certificates without any central certificate management required on behalf of the customer. The private key stored in the TPM, the secure enclave of these devices, never to leave the devices. It can't be transferred, it can't be moved, it's not accessible by us or anybody else. And really leveraging the power of the, uh, these industry standards enable the end user to be brought into the chain of trust. And again, kind of with also because of this, basically what we do is we create the notion of a certificate chain where the identity is the root of that chain through a simple registration process. It creates a root of the identity in our directory. It stores the private key on that device. And then every authentication uses new keys to do a public key issuing signing against the private key to validate that then user uh, to log on without having to pick up a second device, without needing a, a, some form of multi-factor is done on the platform itself. And as a result, we can provide a passwordless authentication experience for both web-based as well as native apps, as well as the desktop login itself. But the critical aspect of this is it doesn't stop just at eliminating the passwords. It's providing a basis of continuous risk-based authentication where we leverage the biometrics to validate that that user. So I know it's Kurt. I know this is a device that Kurt has registered and is bound to my identity with a private key. But because we actually have an authenticator on that platform itself, we can actually grab device security posture to make sure it meets security requirements without the presence of an MDM or EDR solution. So we know is the secure enclave active there? As hard, is the hard drive encrypted? Is the firewall enabled? Is it a personal device or a corporate device? And we can use all these to actually make authentication decisions at the point of authentication, the, the location of the device, any of those things, as opposed to it just being a static device that's in a database to show you've used it before, we actually can show it's bound to your identity. But like the metal detectors at the airport can look at the trustworthiness of the device at the point of login. And, and it really is meant to kind of enable that ability of really increasing the visibility. So instead of zero trust, we're extending that chain of trust to have further visibility onto the user, their device, and the trustworthiness of the device. And again, getting back to the notion of a personal certificate authority, we've also enabled the end user to be able to extend that chain on their own by bring, if I registered initially on my MacBook, I can extend that chain with my iPhone and have a separate private key that sits on that iPhone still bound to my identity. I lose my phone, I can use uh, my other device to uh, just do a QR code rendezvous, validate it's me and sign that with a new private key. So I, as the um, 
user can prune my own certificate tree by adding and removing uh, devices as I move through without having to start from scratch every time. So really it's that power of bringing the convenience to the end user where they no longer need to authenticate. They don't even need to ha have a second device authentication. It happens within the platform itself and that user, as well as giving the context of the device and the security posture at authentication. And because this is, you know, it really is we embracing the standards, we're leveraging, you know, we work on Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Android with the private key stored in those enclaves and TPMs on those devices. Uh, it, it's all cloud-based. We connect to um, single sign-on solutions and applications through the various standards, um, integrating with a number of these um, uh, leading vendors, as well as even MDM and EDR. So if you are using some of these uh, solutions, we can look for the presence of them to understand if it's a corporate managed device before providing access or even pulling those systems to say, oh, there's malware on this device, so we're going to prevent access from it at the point of authentication. And because it is so seamless, we can actually turn session timers down to zero. So you are providing a continuous base of authentication. So if a phone gets jailbroken in the middle of the session, as opposed to just flagging and alerting on that, we can actually deny access to those resources at that time. Just simply, we do this for both workforces and customers. Through workforces, we do it through integration to single sign-on solutions as a delegated IDP. So the experience for the end user is they log into their device, they choose the app, the app goes and looks to a single sign-on solution like Okta, Ping, Fordrock, or Microsoft, who actually redirects to us. And then we issue the public key, sign that, sign that against the private key, grab any of the device information and use that to make authentication decisions. But we can also wrap all of that in an envelope and sign that in the certificate. So we have an immutable audit record linking the identity to the resource, to the um, uh, security posture of that device at the time of authentication. In a customer B2C environment, we work two ways. You can either download a Beyond Identity Authenticator, which uh, is available in the app stores, and that can be tied back to the company server, company app through uh, OAuth connector. We are also have an SDK uh, and APIs that are available to actually embed this in the application itself. So the idea would be that as an update to that application, we can provide the Beyond Identity Authenticator. And again, tying back into uh, the company server to provide a passwordless authentication as well as the opportunity to pull policy and create policy based on that device posture. So at the end of the day, regarding authentication, the best experience for an end user is to have no experience whatsoever. So as we evolve and look at the future of authentication from the earliest passwordless days, we really feel we're bringing a notion of zero trust authentication. Validate the user, know the device that's associated with them and look at the trustworthiness of that device but instead of using passwords, use asymmetric cryptography, uh, X509 certificates without the traditional burden that comes along with it. Over time, we are building more and more into the analytics. So we really are tracking normal uh, log on behavior and authentication behavior. So this can be used for even enhancing that authentication experience to really understand those risk signals, the variances from norm, whether that's coming from our own application or the third party applications we're integrating with because ultimately that's where we feel the, fe the future needs to go that we're building more of these signals in, having more of these signals to really increase our confidence in that if we know it's Kurt, we know it's Kurt's device, we know it's signed with the private key and the trustworthiness of the device, do we care as much about the location of that? And maybe not, but maybe we do if we're seeing location, you know, impossible travel of a log on from Raleigh and San Francisco at the same time, we can start to really refine those. So the idea is let's bring the strongest, most frictionless form of authentication down to the front line. And then we can figure out how to step up authentication based on risk, based on profiles, as opposed to just forcing every end user to uh, go through difficult tractions to go through VPNs with MFA just to get access. So that's our bottom line, really kind of what, you know, we're looking to do is turn both dials, make it a better user experience, make it a stronger, more secure process. And we feel in this day and age with 
identity at the perimeter with more focus and me to understand exactly who that is and what device they're coming from, that we need to take this step. And uh, our, our CEO, Tom Jermalak, uh, often, you know, uses the analogy that, you know, passwords are very much like a virus on their own, and they're spreading more and more like crazy. And it's up to many of us to try to eliminate these passwords. And we need our own form of herd immunity where we can start to get rid of this. So we make it far more difficult for attackers to get in. But instead of zero trust, let's look at this at extending the chain of trust. Know the user, know their device, assess the trustworthiness of the device. And that's our feeling on how authentication needs to evolve. So with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Hey, Kurt, um, th this is Jeff. And I, I, uh, I, I know this is gonna sound like a really broad question and I'm not exactly sure how to, uh, to pose this. So if you'll, <laughs> if you'll bear with me for a minute. Um, uh, this is a really, really informative presentation. And um, I, I, you know, I, I think all of us on this uh, meeting know that the, the password the idea of a password has been broken for quite some time. Um, but I, I wanted to ask this question, um, you know, if we get away from the something you know, um, you know, authentication factor uh, a little bit more by going passwordless, I'm curious about legal ramifications there. And, and I, I'll key in on something that I just, I remember this being a big deal a few years ago when Apple moved the iPhone to Touch ID and then to Face ID. This this issue came up about self incrimination, you know, uh, and I'm I'm no lawyer, but I I understand that we as as American citizens are protected from self incrimination based on the Fifth Amendment, the right the right to remain silent. Uh, we can't incriminate ourselves, and therefore, under duress. Um, and and again, I'm not a lawyer, uh, so this is not legal advice. But under duress, we don't have to necessarily give up our password. However, maybe a fingerprint maybe your face uh, would, would be something that could be given up. Um, do you know, do you have any insight on the legal ramifications of going passwordless in, in the same regard? And I, I should also say, uh, just in case uh, anyone is recording this, um, I have done nothing wrong. I'm just asking the, <laughs> about the general legal ramifications and I'll shut up now. <laughs> 